Good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the NACFC Workshop 2, Agnostic Avenues Alternatives to CF Gene Therapy. My name is Martina Gensch. I'm coming from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and my co-chair is Nam Su Chu from Stanford University. We are very excited to present to you today some alternative research strategies that are not based on gene therapy, but nevertheless uh, have the potential to inform treatment strategies for all people with CF. We put together an uh, interesting and innovative combination of research studies that uh, cover the following topics, synthetic or prosthetic chloride channels, cell transplantation, iPSC technology, ionocytes, which is a cell type that harbors CFTR, immunomodulatory strategies, and also the enhancement of mucocellular clearance. And the objectives of this workshop are to expand your knowledge on alternative routes to overcome defective CFTR that are not based on gene therapy, to discuss strategies for reducing airway inflammation and infection, and finally, to explore strategies to enhance mucosally clearance. And without further ado, I'm happy to invite the first speaker, Daniel Greenman from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, to present on onion selective molecular prosthetics for CFTR that outperform amphotericin B in culture CF epithelia. Welcome, Daniel. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, as she said, my name is Daniel Greenan, and today I'm going to tell you about uh, my research at the University of Illinois on anion selective molecular prosthetics for CFTR, outperform amphotericin B, and cultured CF epithelia. And I have no disclosures for this presentation. So cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease caused by a loss of CFTR protein channel function. And this is hypothesized to create a pathophysiologic anion gradient within the cell. The molecular prosthetics approach to treating this is that a small molecule that is capable of forming ion channels within the membrane can utilize this anion gradient and efflux anions to the apical side, replacing some of the activity of CFTR. Amphotericin B is a small molecule natural product that has shown to be effective as a molecular prosthetic for this purpose and has shown to be good enough to restore some function to the epithelia. However, the question I want to focus on in this presentation is whether we could design a derivative of amphotericin B that is more CFTR-like and would thus be a better replacement for CFTR for this purpose. So CFTR is, of course, a highly anion-selective ion channel that obtains some of its selectivity from these positively charged amino acid residues throughout the transmembrane domain. Amphotericin B, on the other hand, is thought to be an unselective ion channel as it moves both monovalent anions and cations across the gradient, and with it being zwitter ionic, having both a negatively charged carboxylate and a positively charged amine. My colleagues and I hypothesized that we could take some inspiration from how nature incorporates anion selectivity to CFTR and do the same thing for the amphotericin B structure and add an additional positively charged amine to create a derivative that has a that creates a positively charged channel. Uh, previous members in my lab have shown that amphotericin B uh, is effective at replacing CFTR activity, particularly at low concentrations. Uh, it, is a, it is able to uh, mobilize bicarbonate uh, to the ASL, increase the ASL pH, and thus restore some of the airway host offenses when added to cultured CF lung epithelia. However, at high concentrations, amphotericin B has shown to be ineffective at altering the ASL pH regardless of its present ion channel activity. This has been thought to be due to uh, amphotericin B having a high conductivity at these concentrations, as well as the unselective nature of them as it moves both anions and cations across the gradient, such as sodium or potassium. Uh, the cell thus needs to correct for some of these imbalances through the expression of other protein channels. A key one is the AP ATP 12A channel that moves the potassium back into the cell and secretes protons into the ASL. This is thought to be a primary reason for the loss of 
activity of amphotericin B at these high concentrations. My lab has uh, studied two strategies for addressing this limitation and extending the range of effective concentration for amphotericin B. The first strategy is pre-complexing amphotericin B with cholesterol. This has been shown to overall dampen the conductivity of the amphotericin B channels uh, across a wide range of concentrations, leading to a much slower leak of ions to the ASL, uh, and thus preventing the need for the cell to overexpress these other channels, such as ATP12A. And this strategy has shown to be uh, very effective thus far as a uh, optimized dry powder formulation of amphotericin B and cholesterol is in clinical trials currently for cystic fibrosis. However, the strategy that I want to focus on today is whether we could synthetically modify the structure of amphotericin B to yield an ion channel that is inherently more selective to anions than cations. As I mentioned previously, our, the way we intend to do this is through the addition of, additional, of a positive charged amine, specifically an ethylene diamine appendage being added to the C16 carboxylate. This effectively blocks a negative charge while adding an additional positive charge to create the derivative amphotericin AA. This derivative was tested alongside amphotericin B in a current clamped oozing chamber experiment, whereby controlling the ions on either side of uh, wild type FRT epithelia and creating a gradient of sodium chloride to one side before adding in our ion channels bilaterally, we're able to measure the changes in voltage uh, after this addition and thus calculate the permeability of chloride to sodium of these ion channels. And what we discovered is that amphotericin B channels uh, showed a positive voltage change, showing it to be more likely to move cations across the membrane than anions, while amphotericin AA showed to elicit a negative voltage change as it moved more negatively charged ions across the membrane. This calculated to a permeability of chloride to sodium that is about 50 times greater than that of amphotericin B. Due to this increased anion selectivity of these channels, it allowed it to um, significantly improve the ASL pH recovery when added to cultured CF uh, airway epithelia. Amphotericin B, as mentioned before, is effective at increasing this pH, particularly at low concentrations before the efficacy falls at 50 and 100 micromolar. Amphotericin AA, on the other hand, extends this range of concentration all the way up to 100 micromolar while creating a change in the ASL pH that is between 0.4 and 0.6 pH units when tested. This increase in the ASL pH correlates with a decrease of this key, key ATP12A protein channel. As I mentioned previously, at high concentrations of amphotericin B, this protein channel uh, shows to overexpress and be overactive, creating this acidification effect. However, whenever we had anion selective amphotericin B channels, uh, the expression of, these channel, of this ATP12A protein channel is decreased thus allowing the efficacy to be extended all the way up to 100 micromolar. However, a key limitation that we found of amphotericin AA is that it shows to be more toxic than amphotericin B when it's added to cultured CF lung epithelia, uh, particularly at 50 micromolar, while amphotericin B shows no significant toxicity. Uh, with this uh, in mind, we asked whether we could uh, synthesize the derivative of amphotericin B that keeps these key ion channel properties of the molecule while making it less toxic. To do that, we asked, uh, to do this, I looked at some of the previous work that's been done in my lab on the toxicity mechanism of amphotericin B. And what's been discovered is that amphotericin B exists as both an ion channel form in the membrane and a sponge aggregate. So in this sponge aggregate form, it is known to extract sterols such as cholesterol or ergosterol from the mechanism of cholesterol or ergosterol from the membrane as a primary mechanism of its toxicity. This sponge aggregate form has been modeled uh, based off of solicite NMR studies from our collaborator, Dr. Chad Reinster from the University of Wisconsin, uh, where they're able to highlight some of the key interactions that amphotericin B has with sterols in this sponge aggregate form. And what we found is that uh, a primary interaction is with this mycosamine amine appendage of the amphotericin B structure. Amphotericin AA is hypothesized to have a very similar mechanism of toxicity, as it also binds to cholesterol when 
test it in a UV vis based assay. And whenever amphotericin A is, is pre complex to cholesterol before addition to CF lung epithelia, its toxicity is uh, reduced significantly. We've used this um, model of the sponge aggregate to add in our ethylene diamine side chain to where we're able to observe that, that it does not appear to significantly interfere with this key interactions that it has with sterile molecules. As well as, as highlighted on the right, it shows to fit into this um, section of the sponge. Previous members of my lab have shown to create a derivative of amphotericin B that disrupts cholesterol binding through a targeted a pimerization of the C2 prime hydroxy group on the macosamine amine. This shows to uh, alter the orientation of the molecule when in the sponge aggregate, preventing cholesterol binding, as seen in the UV vis based assay. This results in a derivative that is non toxic when added to cholesterol chaining cell lines, such as primary renal cells or cultured CF lung epithelia. However, we are unsure whether by uh, alt disrupting this cholesterol binding, if it would still be able to form ion channels in membranes or not. So we tested in two different systems using amphotericin B as a positive control for channel formation and either natamycin or C35-methyl ether amphotericin B as a negative control, as these are polymacrolides with no ion channel activity. What we observed when we added these derivatives to 10% cholesterol-containing liposomes is that the C2 prime epimerization uh, of amphotericin B uh, still was able to form ion channels and cause an efflux of chloride from the liposomes in a similar manner to that of amphotericin B channels, while the natomycin natural product was unable to uh, cause significant ion channel flux or chloride efflux. Similarly, when we add these derivatives to uh, cultured CF lung epithelia, uh, C2 prime epi amphotericin B results in a pH change that is comparable to that of amphotericin B, while the C35 methyl ether derivative uh, was unable to affect the ASL pH as it is unable to form ion channels in the membrane. Uh, with these two modifications in mind, we synthesized a next generation molecular prosthetic called C2 prime epi amphotericin AA that has this pimerization of the C2 prime hydroxy group and the added positively charged ethylene diamine chain uh, to the C16 carboxylate. And this results in a derivative that has no detectable binding to cholesterol and thus a reduced toxicity when added to cultured CF lung epithelia while still being able to form ion channels in membranes uh, that when tested in a, the same current clamped oozing chamber experiment tested to be more anion selective than that of amphotericin B. And then finally, when we added these derivative to uh, primary cultured airway epithelia from people with CF, uh, we noticed that it was able to robustly increase ASL pH at both 2 and 50 micromolars, showing its efficacy as a potential molecular prosthetic for CFTR. Uh, from this research, I learned that if we design amphotericin B to be more CFTR-like, uh, it can result in derivatives that better recover airway host defenses, such as ASL pH recovery in vitro, and that the addition of a positively charged amine to amphotericin B structure allows for the formation of anion selective ion channels. We noted that the excessive proton secretion from ATP 12A overexpression is reduced when we add these anion selective amphotericin B channels, and we're able to synthesize a next generation molecular prosthetic called C2 prime epi amphotericin AA that mitigates this toxicity that we occurs in amphotericin AA by disrupting the cholesterol binding while still being able to form anion selective ion channels that robustly increased ASL pH and primary cultured airway epithelia from people with CF. I'd like to thank uh, all my colleagues who helped work on this project with me, especially Noemi Solis and Jonathan Marin Toledo. I'd like to thank um, Aga, my advisor, Professor Martin D. Burke, and the collaborators from the University of Iowa, particularly Dr. Ian Thornell and Michael Welsh. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Daniel. Are there any questions from the audience? I actually had a question in regard of the cell types. Um, as I say, say is the distribution of your molecule is similar between different cell types, or is a different lipid composition of the membrane? Because theoretically, you would expect it to be useful in secretory cells, ionocytes, and so on, where CFTR usually is. But is it actually really 
getting into the membrane of all cells, have you looked at that? And the other question I had, do you know anything about the half-life of your molecule, how long it stays there? Uh, so yeah, um, previous member of my lab, uh, uh, Dr. Aga Lewandowska has tested the, that it actually stays when added in vitro um, to these epithelia, it actually is able to uh, produce an increase in the pH that is sustained up to two weeks, I think. And we have tested it in different um, compositions of sterols, and there is somewhat a, of an effect of changing sterols or changing the amount of sterols and the amount of ions that are effluxed, but it is still able to efflux without the sterol composition. Okay. Next question. Um, Ron Rubenstein, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, do you have more extensive dose response data on any of these? You showed most of your data with single concentrations. And the other question is, at that concentration at 50 micromolar, how much would you need to deliver to an airway to get an effective concentration? Um, very good question. Uh, in terms of the different doses, um, we primarily focused on that dose, as we saw the most clean difference between amphotericin B and amphotericin AA. At higher concentrations, um, like at 100 micromolar or more, there is a more noticeable effect on the toxicity. Uh, but if you add it in a formulation, those effects can be mitigated. And I'm um, sorry, can you repeat the second question? The second question was about how much would you need to deliver to the airway, gram-wise, mole-wise, uh, gram-wise, to get that effective concentration in an airway? Um, that's a good question. Uh, for this research, it's been focused on in vitro work um, and not uh, to lung specifically, but you could talk to um, the people at Synthetic Medicine about that. Hi, uh, great talk, interesting data, Stuart Owens, Boston Children's. Um, I guess I had a couple questions. Um, you mentioned it's in vitro work. Any plans to move towards an in vivo model? Because um, I guess my, my question is you showed some in vitro data for lung epithelia and, and renal cells, but as a clinician, when I think amphotericin, I think massive systemic side effects, particularly nephrotoxicity, which you've covered a little in vitro, so I'm, I'm wondering if you'll move towards an in vivo model. And then my next question is the, the steric modifications you, you made to reduce the, the toxicity in your modified amphotericin. Is there any um, precedence in the field for those sort of modifications in amphotericin in general? Because when we think about, like we use lipo, liposomal amphotericin, which has reduced toxicity in traditional amphotericin, mm -hmm. is there any role of the same modifications in sort of reducing the overall toxicity of a drug we sometimes have to reach for in our CF patients in general, even before we get to you know, advance? post-gene therapy, post-modulator stuff? Uh, yeah, so great question. Um, yeah, a lot of the field for amphotericin B on studying it do tend to focus on the different formulations, and those do have uh, somewhat of a beneficial effect. Our lab specifically is better at um, organic synthesis of the molecule, so um, there has been a recent uh, paper from our lab that showed that this uh, C2 prime epimerization is effective at um, altering the toxicity of this. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're confident, and that's been tested in some in vivo work in mice or rats. Uh, but in terms of uh, my work specifically, I haven't tested any CF in vivo models. I think that'd be very interesting, but I haven't gotten to that point yet. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Is this channel can be regulated? Certain way. I'm sorry. This channel can be regulated, regulatable. The channel. Regulatable. Yeah. Whether can you, can your molecule be regulated that it's more active or less active? Yeah. By uh, adding drug or something. Um. It more is like is like a passive ion channel that takes advantage of the gradients already okay. in the membrane. Uh, there is somewhat of an effect of adding cholesterol to it that dampens this conductivity, mm -hmm. but um, otherwise, that's the only regulation that we okay. observed. Thanks very much, Daniel. Is there no further questions?
Okay, the second speaker is uh, Kevin, Kevin Chen. Uh, the title is Primary Mouse Tracheal Basal Cells Transplanted into CFTL Knockout, knockout Mice Reconstitute CFTL Function. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Kevin, and I am a third-year MD-PhD candidate in the Darrow Cotton's lab over right here in the Center for Regenerative Medicine, or as we like to call it, the CREM, uh, located in Boston University and Boston Medical Center. And I'm excited to share some very new data, actually, about um, trans uh, planting these CFTR replete mouse basal cells into a CFTR null mouse trachea. I have no disclosures. So um, given that we are in an ag agnostics avenue session, I would like to really talk about how we are envisioning this um, platform of autologous cell therapy to really treat CF, which we envision a future in which when we take uh, cells from a CF patient, we can reprogram them into an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then gene edit them ex vivo to correct an underlying mutation and following decades of work in establishing directed differentiation protocols, we may be able to generate, and we can generate, um, a epithelial or a cell of interest that we can then transplant back into the same patient. And so today I'm really going to focus on talking about um, this transplantation angle of this wheel and how we can make this, uh, march this along the path to the clinic. Sorry for all the, the dips. So, um, for today, I'm going to attempt to convince you that the right type of cell to transplant and that I believe is important for engrafting the stem cell compartment is the uh, basal cell. Um, I'm going to talk about how we've really worked out a way to condition the trachea to uh, make space for these donor cells to engraft. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the data in which we've started to really ask what are the cells that we have been engrafting. And I'm also going to show you some stuff on how we've started to apply this to a mouse model of, of CF. All right, so um, now it's been worked out for many years that basal cells are the resident stem cells of the airway. If uh, you look at this cartoon, um, the basal cell can reconstitute uh, the vast, you know, the pretty much the airway, full airway repertoire of epithelial cell lineages. Um, including, importantly, these rare uh, epithelial cell types, of which the ionocyte is one of them. And this is important because the ionocyte has been recently found to express the highest levels of, uh, of CFTR uh, message. And so given that we have a candidate uh, cell type to engraft the stem cell compartment, how do we actually go about it? Well, for many years, uh, it's kind of eluded our lab uh, how we can get a cell to engraft in its native niche. And until last year, a previous MD-PhD student in our lab has really uh, published in cell stem cell that we, can, we have to make room in the trachea to, in order for a donor cell to come in and land. And so the way we make space in the trachea is to administer this detergent called polydocanol, which when we uh, give it to the mice uh, intratracheally, it results in airway sloughing that really peaks at five hours. And if you look at the five hour time mark, you can see that the basement membrane is bare and you have uh, sparse basal cells remaining on the surface. And so I would like to just walk you through what we, on a transplant day, what that experiment looks like. So if we were to transplant primary mouse basal cells, the donor cell here is from a UBC GFP mouse in which all the cells in that mouse is green. We can digest that trachea and grow out the primary tracheal basal cells ex vivo and expand them. On the day of transplant, our recipients, which are on the same genetic mouse background, these are both black six mice, um, we can uh, deliver polydocanol in the morning, wait five hours, and then put um, these uh, basal cells oropharyngeally down the mouse trachea and wait for six weeks. And when we wait for six weeks and then we explant the mouse trachea, this is what we might see under the microscope. And so what this is, is this is a mouse trachea that's been filleted open, cut along its ventral side so it lies flat like a book, and the inner luminal side is facing you, and you can see that vast swaths of the epithelium has been replaced by green cells. 
And you might be asking, what are these green cells? And this is also what Martin had asked. And these green cells, these green basal cells that we've transplanted um, reconstitute the expected major trilineage of the airway, including the acetylated tubulin cell uh, in the top panel marked by the acetylated tubulin expression, which co-localizes with the green. Um, the basal cells, of course, retain both their green and their K5 marker, and they can also uh, differentiate into secreted globin 1A1 positive uh, secretory cells. Uh, importantly, these uh, transplanted cells that we, we see here also retain their NKX 2-1 uh, master lung regulator marker. And so Martin asked, as we all wanted to know, what is the, how similar are these donor-derived cells that we've transplanted? Uh, how similar are they to the endogenous mouse recipient? If we look at one green cell in the mouse trachea, and then say there is a mouse uh, recipient cell right next to it that's not green, do these cells, are these cells similar enough to each other? And so to answer that question, we did single cell RNA sequencing. And right here is a uh, uh, dimensionally reduced uh, data projected onto a 2D axis where you know, each dot is a cell that contains the full gene expression program in that cell. And so what we can really do with uh, single cell RNA sequencing is identify cell clusters um, to annotate what they are, at least transcriptomically, in terms of the programs, cellular programs they express. And so what you see here in the green are cells um, that have been sequenced from the, uh, that are GFP positive, overlaid with the endogenous GFP negative uh, mouse cells. And what was very, very cool to see is that they overlay almost perfectly. And so when we look at what are the cell types that we've engrafted and we annotate the clusters, we see that the uh, GFP donor derived cells reconstitute um, all of the airway lineages in vivo. Um, including these rare cell types that you can see in red. Um, up top, uh, you can see the ionocytes. So given that uh, we have now um, transplanted cells and we think we've reconstituted airway lineage, you might be wondering how durable is engrafting the stem cell compartment? How much um, durability can we expect from this type of, you know, pretty expensive therapy if we were to put it into humans. And so here is a mouse two years post-transplant towards the end of the mouse's lifespan. And the green signal is undiminished. And to really test that we've engrafted the stem cell compartment, these basal cells should exhibit you know, the stem cell uh, self-renewal capacity indefinitely. And what we've done is a serial transplantation experiment where if you take, if we transplant a mouse, and then we take those basal cells out, grow them out in ex vivo, and then transplant them into a second generation of mouse, you should still see a signal. And you can do this for a third generation, a fourth generation, a fifth generation. And when you look at what's going on in that fifth generation, you can see that they reconstitute the expected trilineage. So we're at the eighth generation now, and so we have a donor basal cell that's been living in vivo in a mouse for much longer than the actual lifespan of a mouse. Okay, so now that we um, have a transplantation platform that we think um, works, the next step is how do we develop a preclinical in vivo model of cell replacement for CF? And this kind of project really can't be accomplished alone. And, um, you know, shout out to the Bruchia and Egan Lab at Yale, where their expertise in electrophysiology readouts of the trachea and um, their understanding of the CF mouse model is. Um, really integral to the success of this project. And here we are, um, one January afternoon, where we've driven down to Yale to transplant cells. And this is, we're smiling because this is right before we actually transplant the cells. Uh, so the goal here is to understand the functional capacity of a transplanted cell in its native niche. The mouse model uh, we used was published in 1992. And while it's gut corrected, uh, these cell, this mouse model doesn't fully recapitulate the airway, doesn't phenocopy the airway uh, CF phenotype. However, it does display abnormal CFTR dependent current where there's no forskolin IBMX um, stimulated current. So uh, I wanna take you through what we actually did um, on that day in Yale. And the donor cells that we uh, transplanted into these mice are from a UBC GFP mouse, which is on the black six background. Uh, we grew them out uh, over a period of a month, drove them down, and on the day of transplant, we uh, administered polydocanol to these CFTR null mice. Uh, and so the recipient here, the CFTR null trachea, we transplanted and we waited for six weeks. 
So the question here is, presumably, if we regenerate the epithelial with our transplanted cells, does this rescue the underlying electrophysiology defect? Well, six weeks later, when um, the Rushia lab uh, explanted the trachea uh, and they looked under the microscope, they saw this. So this is a uh, CFTR null trachea that's been filleted open. And uh, you can see that vast swaths of it, just like the um, data that Martin has shown before, uh, you can see that the, the trachea has been replaced with green positive cells. Uh, I'm going to show some very new data that just came out uh, this week. And uh, we, that data pertains to what these cells are. And uh, like before, we took two transplant mouse uh, recipients, we digested the trachea, and then we sorted out the GFP positive and negative cells to really compare the transcriptome of, of the donor-derived cells and the endogenous mouse recipients. And we can find on a UMAP projection of these cells that our GFP positive donor cells occupy that space. When we look, when we annotate these clusters, we can see that our donor derived cells in the CFTR null trachea has reconstituted the major airway lineages of basal, secretory, and ciliated, but also these rare uh, cells, including the ionocytes, which are labeled by that cluster in, with the arrow. Now, the question is uh, does that lead to actual reconstitution of CFTR message and function? Well, in our um, CFTR null mice that we've transplanted, you can see that compared to a CFTR null mouse uh, mRNA by qPCR, we see appearance of the CFTR message and we see appearance of the GFP message. So the expression of CFTR has increased by transplanting CFTR replete cells into a CFTR null trachea. Now the big question is, does this rescue the electrophysiology readout in these mice? Uh, right after we take those epifluorescence images of those green tracheas, Dr. Egan's lab then takes them and conducts tracheal um, electrophysiology read, uh, measurements with the Eusings chamber assay. And when you take those CF null, CFTR null mice trachea and you expose them to a force clone uh, IBMX, there is no induced current. But when we look at our um, CFTR null mice that have been transplanted with CFTR replete basal cells, we see recovery of this force gland IVMX current to levels that are comparable to the heterozygous litter mate controls. To really understand if this contribution, uh, this current recovery is due to the CFTR channel, Dr. Egan's lab then administered a CFTR inhibitor 172, which uh, after uh, force gland IVMX induced current will reveal the magnitude of the contribution of the CFTR channel. And you can see that in seven out of our eight uh, recipients, there is a uh, dramatic increase in the magnitude of that uh, current change compared to the CF null, null control at the very right of the graph. And so in summary, I hope to have convinced you today that at least we can transplant primary basal cells into a CFTR null mice for the very first time. And when we take these tracheas out of these mice six weeks after, we can get a green trachea that by histology, we can see uh, the cells recapitulate the uh, airway lineages and they reconstitute not just the major trilineage, but also potentially rare uh, epithelial cell populations. Uh, transplanting cells like this has the potential to then uh, increase the CFTR expression and message and then finally, functionally, by reco reconstituting the response of the CFTR-dependent current. And so um, I really would like to thank all the members of the Cotton Lab, and especially my mentors, uh, Daryl Cotton, Finn Hawkins, and Andrew Barrickle, without which our experiments would have been 10 times harder. And I would like to give a special thanks to every, each and every member of the Bushia Egan Lab at Yale. And my funding sources are listed below, and uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, nice work. Uh, congratulations. I have a few questions. First, your injury model, is that a reversible model? In other words, if you just were to leave it alone, the airway would just completely regenerate. And second, in your, your, um, your last experiment, when you're transplanting to the CFTR null mice, 
Um, you use single cell analysis to determine what cell lineages emerge. Did you look at the CFTR expression at the single cell level to see where the CFTR expression is coming from and if those cells are contributing to the functional restoration? Good questions. And uh, the answer to the first question is uh, the injury model is reversible. Uh, polydolcanol, when we administer it, it sloughs out the epithelium, but by 12 hours, the epithelium has already started to, the basal cells started to spread out and, uh, pres uh, and cover the basement membrane. By a week post polydocanol, the full airway epithelium is recovered uh, with no aberrant um, metaplasia or weird cells that we could observe, at least by histology. When we look at the single cell for the expression of CFTR, I think it's important to note for this mouse model, it's not a CFTR knockout, so it's a um, CFTR null mouse. So you can detect CFTR transcripts still in the CFTR uh, null animal, and we will have to do some bio further bioinformatic analyses really to kind of isolate the effect of which cells are expressing CFTR. So you showed beautiful transplantation into the tray here, but CF airway disease obviously starts in the small airways. Are you planning to do similar studies on bronchi? Oh, on the bronchi, on the yeah. small airways. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah, so translationally, I think CFTR in the human occurs in the small airways. I think the mouse small airways are a little different fundamentally from a human's in which uh, there are no endogenous basal cells in the small airways. Um, rather, we have these uh, CC10 um, mm -hmm. club cells. So uh, whether or not you know, transplanting basal cells into the small airways is an uh, open question. Or at least into bronchi. Into bronchii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it'll be interesting to look at mm -hmm. uh, what, what is going on in the bronchii of, this, bronchi of these mice, for sure. See, other question I have, it's mm -hmm. kind of detailed, but I'm wondering, you had the majority of your mice had CFTR expressed, I think like eight or 10 um, from the ones you looked at, but there mm -hmm. was one that didn't. Do you have any idea what might be the reason? Yeah, that's... Um, that is, uh, that is one of those uh, things that uh, I'm still perplexed by, but also asking in terms of, is it related to the engraftment efficiency? So um, one hypothesis is that the, those tracheas, the mice that did not respond, there was just no engraftment. And we do see variability in our engraftments. Um, not all mice get transplanted successfully. It is uh, sometimes technique dependent. And um, sometimes there is no signal, but we get transplant success in vast majority of cases. However, when I quantify the degree of engraftment efficiency related to the rescue of the current, um, the correlation right now is still pretty weak. So I don't know how much you need to replace of the epithelium to recover current. Thank you. Susan? Hi, uh, Susan Burke at UAB. Um, to ask a follow-up to that question, if I realize this is difficult to tell in a mouse if it's engrafted or not, but would there be the opportunity to repeat the therapy in case you could do like a bronch or a brushing to, to check for CFTR um, presence and, and sort of go again if, if uh, uh, like a larger animal or a patient did not take the engraftment the first time? Um, are you asking, uh, is there a way to uh, do multiple rounds of cell therapy? Yes. Uh, like down the line translation um, in a human? Yes. Um, I, I think so. If, if, if an autologous therapy were to materialize in that we have banked a patient cells and can make patient-specific basal cells, there, I think there could be a future in which we administer a cell therapy more than once, um, given that the cells are banked and can be manufactured. Next question comes from Chad Mahoney from the CFF. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Chad from the CFF. No. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm, I'm fascinated with the primary basal cells that were able to persist about five lifespans of the mouse. Uh, in general, we think of primary human basal cells only having a finite lifespan. Could you comment to why you think, or do you think that's going to be able to cross species to humans? Is it just niche? Could you just make some comments on, on to why mm. five lifespans? Thanks, Jed, for that uh, tricky question. I, I, I don't know if the mouse uh, cell persisting for over the lifespan of the mice is necessarily translatable to humans. I know uh, primary human uh, cultures um, in our hands have never been able to uh, persist for longer than, I think, somewhere in the range of five to 10 passages. The mouse basal cells, uh, on the other hand, when we culture them ex vivo, my, in my experience, we've been able to culture them um, somewhat indefinitely. And I wonder if there is a species-specific difference. Uh, I, I don't believe that a mouse cell will be able to make the jump into a human airway. And I don't know if that's what you were asking in terms of, maybe I, you're probably asking whether or not we can expect to see similar 
effects in the human. I don't know. Um, maybe it, uh, maybe an IPSC could, because uh, in culture, our IPSCs can really renew indefinitely. It's lovely data in primary, but I'm, I'm curious, have you made, what strides have you made in using IPSC-derived cells for transplantation? And as sort of a follow-on question, mm -hmm. do you see this, the arc of this therapy being a gene editing and IPSC transplant, or depending on timeline, is it take the patient cells out and then do editing of the primary cells, maybe with the prime editing method, and then put in edited primary cells yes. in the long term? Mm -hmm. uh, good question. Uh, in terms of the first question, what has been done on the IPSC front? So uh, Martin's paper in Cell Stem Cell last year, uh, we were able to use both primary and IPSC-derived mice and human basal cells to transplant into either a um, syngeneic uh, mouse, the black six mouse, or, I mean, sorry, a 129 mouse, or um, transplant human basal cells from derived from human IPSCs into a NSG mouse. So um, we are able to um, show that it reflects the data we see in the primary cells. There's differences, though, in the IPSC-derived basal cells compared to a primary basal cell. Those uh, cells do not overlay single bias transcriptomic analysis, um, but they do reconstitute the same lineages uh, in vivo. Um, the second question you had was, uh, is, this a, is there a case for really um, envisioning whether primary cell transplants would be a viable approach or something concurrent that we could do with iPSCs? Uh, I, I think so. Uh, I think the difficulty has been, um, I think as Jed's question previously alluded to, just the current um, struggle in the field we have with uh, culturing human bronchial cells, primary cells, for a long period of time. And uh, we do need some time to expand cells to the requisite numbers that we can use for transplant. Like for reference, we transplant about 6 million uh, cells into the mouse trachea. When you scale that up to a human, probably need a lot of cells. Um, and I mean, just I guess a frame of reference, as we think about like doing a ferret cell transplant when we move to a larger animal, um, some back of the envelope calculations, we think we need at least 600 million. So I think when it comes to comparing what's out there on the market to what we need to produce, there's still a, um, there's still a limitation for using primary human cells, but very viable approach, I think, also. Thank you, Kevin, for this wonderful presentation. <laughs> Our next speaker is Stuart Rollins from Boston Children's Hospital. And he will tell us about Fox I1 deletion, Alters ion transport, and cellular composition in an IPSC based airway system. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to speak today in front of so many uh, friends and new friends. Um, my name is Stuart Rollins. I'm a junior attending at Boston Children's, working in the lab of Ruby Wong. And I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, leveraging an induced pluripotent stem cell-based airway system for interrogating the role of FOXI1 in the pulmonary ionocyte, specifically with regards to ion transport and the cellular composition of the airway epithelium. And they see if there's disclosure. I have no disclosures. So I think everyone in this room is aware of the fact that you know, single-cell RNA-seq analysis has really done wonders for enriching our understanding of the respiratory epithelium. And as CF clinicians in a CF-focused lab, one of the rare cell types that we're most interested in is the pulmonary ionocyte, a cell that's most notable, I think, in the CF field for a very high amount of overall CFTR transcript. Um, there are multiple groups doing fantastic work in trying to characterize the pulmonary ionocyte, um, leveraging different in vivo and in vitro models that I won't get into here. But I'm going to try and convince you of is that using an induced pluripotent stem cell derived aeropithelium can contribute a lot to this field. Um, and so just to, to touch on how complicated uh, this work is, um, so this is a, a brief schematic of the directed differentiation of taking an induced pluripotent stem cell all the way to air-liquid interface of a pseudostratified airway epithelium. And uh, this is the work that we principally carry out in the Wong lab, and this builds off of years and years of work in other uh, labs, principally uh, Dr. Cotton's lab under uh, uh, Dr. Cotton and Finn Hawkins. Um, and so we seek to use the IPSC system to study lung physiology and pathophysiology and respiratory disease, specifically CF. 
And uh, one of the beautiful things about the IPSC system is because you're starting with induced pluripotent stem cells, they're much more amenable to precision gene editing techniques than primary cells. So if you're looking to interrogate the function of a gene or to remove a certain population, it can be a wonderful system. Um, so our hypothesis going into this was that by modulating FOXI1 expression, a known canonical marker of pulmonary ionocytes, we could alter the expression of pulmonary ionocytes in our iPSC-derived airway epithelium in order to better understand what contributions these rare cell types are having in terms of airway physiology and cell composition. Uh, so to do that, we start with a healthy um, a wild type CFDR donor um, that they, their cells are reprogrammed from blood to induce pluripotent stem cells. We do CRISPR-Cas9 based gene editing to knock out uh, the transcription factor FOXI1 uh, to produce a pair of syngeneic lines. Um, they're further sequenced for confirmation. And essentially what we're left with is a syngeneic background where the only alteration is removal of this transcription factor. Uh, we subsequently have them undergo a parallel directed differentiation based on the schema I just showed you. For both of these lines, we're able to show um, lung progenitor NKX, that is NKX positive cell um, efficiency similar to our other cultures, as well as uh, robust basal cell generation even on the first NGFR sort. They undergo subsequent purification and they're ultimately plated as a pure induced pluripotent stem cell derived basal cell uh, onto a transwell based system that many of you are going to be familiar with and cultured to air liquid interface. Um, so these are the this was the initial experiment we started with, and then I'll get into why we, we subsequently went back and we took our knockout line and seeking to restore FOXI1 expression, we did another round of Cas9-based gene editing to add back into that knockout line uh, a FOXI1 uh, cassette under a DOCS promoter with an M-Cherry reporter. So now I've got three lines, a wild type, a knockout, and a knockout where I can turn my gene of interest back on. And again, uh, acceptable degrees of efficiency in terms of generating lung progenitor and basal cells, and all three cultures were able to generate air-liquid interface cultures that um, persisted for more than two months. So when we knock out FOXI1, the first thing we are interested in is, do we see any alteration in the presence of pulmonary ionocytes or their markers? And indeed, when we uh, take out FOXI1 in our induced pluripotent stem cell lines, we don't see any detectable FOXI1 by immunofluorescence or transcript. And um, we don't see uh, any detectable BSND in our knockout line, which is a, a marker of more mature ionocytes. And we see a reduction in multiple ionocyte markers, including CFTR um, in our knockout line compared to wild type. And I'll say, as you culture these cells, when you look at the FOX I1 knockout cells, even before we did any of the IFA or transcriptional analysis, the first thing that strikes you is they really do have a, a more thick, tenacious mucus. You have to work a little bit harder to clean them. And um, we're working on doing more quantitative analysis of that. But you can sort of see that here on the far left in the bright field representative images I'm showing you of our wild type and our knockout line. Interestingly enough, when you do immunofluorescence microscopy on these lines, um, you do see uh, a increased incidence of muc like B positive cells detectable in the knockout line compared to the wild type line. Um, we do detect the presence of all major cell types um, by FA and transcript. Um, what's a, also sort of interesting is you, you see a, a comparative increase in some markers of other rare cell types in our FOXI1 knockout line, including uh, the tough cell marker, PLU2F3, and the pulmonary neuroendocrine cell marker, ASCL1. Um, but what we're really interested in most is sort of functional data. And one of the easiest ways, well, not that easy, but one of the best ways to do that is with an Usings chamber analysis for electrophysiology studies. Um, so this is a representative tracing of our FOXI1 wild type culture um, shown here in blue. And for this Usings trace, uh, this is essentially a measure of short circuit current potential under different drug conditions. So we give a milliride. Um, to reduce ENAC channels, forskolin uh, to stimulate channel opening, including CFTR, and then CFTR inhibitor 172 to selectively uh, close CFTR, and we can measure the short circuit current potential difference um, across our epithelia. And so you see the wild type culture here actually compares pretty favorably to, to primary. Um, but when we do parallel experiments with our FOXI1 knockout culture, which we think have reduced ionocyte expression, we see a significant but not completely um, obliterated response to both forskolin and CFTR inhibitor 172. 
as you can see in these representative Usings tracings. And then we um, we repeated this experiment four times, um, always with paired lines under paired conditions. Um, this is symmetric media for the Usings. Um, and you can see here um, that we did see a significant uh, increased response to forskolin and a significant reduction in short, cir short circuit current potential um, when exposed to CFGR inhibitor 172 in our wild type line compared to our knockout line. And then um, on the far right here is again representative microscopy um, taken from parallel trans wells from the same cult on the same day that the Usings was performed in these cells. So you can see it once again in our knockout line, no detectable BSND without to be a mature ionocyte marker and a significant number of ionocytes in the wild type culture. And so having seen this phenotype, we were curious to see if we could take that knockout line and if we restored FOXI1 expression, would we restore the presence of ionocytes and could we restore our um, CFTR mediate ion transport? And indeed, when we uh, take our cultures. So uh, these are parallel cultures done under two different conditions. So this is a Fox I1 knockout background with a with a Fox I1 dox inducible cassette. So if you add doxycycline, you turn on Fox I1 expression, or you can add an empty vehicle as a control. And what we see is when we expose our cultures to doxycycline to turn on Fox I1 expression, we get a restoration of that forskolin and CFTR inhibitor 172 response, suggestive that Fox I1 and, and putatively pulmonary ionocytes are playing a role in that response for our IPSC airway epithelial cultures. And uh, being uh, CF clinicians, one of the things that we're sort of most interested in is how relevant would the, the ionocyte be in terms of restoring CFTR-mediated uh, chloride flux within a, within a CF background? So in this case, we're taking two IPSC lines. Uh, one is an established Delta 508 homozygote uh, CF line, and to that, uh, we add um, a smaller population of our DOCS inducible line. And remember, this is a line that has wild type CFTR. And then in parallel, we culture, uh, we culture uh, uh, two different sets of the, the mixed population of cells. One is uh, exposed to an empty vehicle control. The other is given doxycycline to turn on the Fox I1 expression in that CFTR wild type cell population. Uh, and indeed, what we see is within that Delta 508 background, if you had a smaller population of cells uh, that we think are ionocytes based on turning on Fox I1 expression with a wild type CFTR, um, you get a nice restoration of that CFTR mediated uh, ion transport response, at least by Using's chamber analysis. Um, so that's really what I have for you today. It's obviously very prelim data, very in vitro, um, but we think that it represents um, a good starting point of suggesting uh, the role of FOXI1 in ionocyte development, that knocking out FOXI1 uh, likely removes the presence of at least a large population of pulmonary ionocytes, that the reduction in that population of, of pulmonary ionocytes seems to reduce CFTR-mediated ion transport, and that by increasing the number of FOXI1 positive cells, putatively ionocytes that express wild type CFTR in a CF background, you can rescue CFTR mediated ion transport. Um, I'll say that none of this is possible without a ton of people, um, principally my PI, Ruby Wong, who's right there in the front, um, all of our lab members, and then I would say um, I'd like to call particularly uh, members of the CREM, uh, Finn Hawkins, who was on my scholarly oversight committee when I was in pediatric pulmonology fellowship, and Dr. Cotton, who's been a great mentor um, both to Ruby Wong and to myself whenever I've had to approach him, and then the, the CF Foundation, um, without whom I, I honestly wouldn't have a, a research career. I'm a straight MD. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I'm happy to take any questions, and uh, thank you all. Thank you, Stuart, for that great presentation. Um, really wonderful data. Um, I wonder whether you could give us your um, take on the role of ionocytes versus CFTI and ionocytes versus secretory cells. That is the question of the hour, isn't it? Um, so, and I think that's something where I will say when I first approached this project, I am and, and still am something of an ionoskeptic. 
um, just because the secretory cells vastly outnumber um, the pulmonary ionocytes. But at the same time, it's a conserved, relatively rare population of cells with this high degree of CFTR transcript, a lot of ATP-mediated channels. It's a very energy-demanding cell. And so I have to speculate that it's playing some role within the respiratory epithelium. Whether it's the most critical role I can't say right now. And one of the things that we're interested in studying, and I think the IPSC system in particular is really well suited for because you can do a bunch of different things with precision gene editing and reporter constructs and things to study cell-cell communication, is to figure out what role, if any, are ionocytes interacting with the secretory cells or how are secretory cells influencing ionocytes. My guess is that it's going to be the interplay between the two of them, not one more than the other. I do think that the at least the data that we've see shown in our IPSC system suggests that if you artificially increase the number of ionocytes, you can get a response. How that translates to real world physiology is more of an open question because we know, you know, if you correct CFDR within a broader population of cells, the majority of which just by statistics are going to be secretory, you also can get a response. So it's a, it's a fun question in the field. And I think the systems that we're working with are, are good tools to answer those questions. Great answer. Next question. Nice work. Um, I have a question. Um, can you explain how knocking out FOXI1 alter the, the differentiation of the cells into ciliated and secretories? Okay. And so this is one where we're trying to do a little bit more of a precise experimental condition because one, when we're knocking out FOXI1, you're taking out a transcription factor and then doing a directed differentiation. So you're running into a lot of potential risk that the loss of that transcription factor could be altering the development of other cell types in a way that's maybe not relevant to ionocyte specific function. And so what we're trying to do to answer that now is I've got a reporter construct with a, uh, a caspase 9 based suicide gene. So basically we'll have a system set up where cells when they express enough FOXI1, that'll be detectable with a fluorescent reporter, and then we can trigger caspase 9 to kill off that cell population. And so I'll be able to selectively delete mature ionocytes within a population without altering the presence of FOXI1 during directed differentiation or even at the basal cell stage. Right now, it's really speculative. In an ideal world, it'd be that, you know, presence or absence of ionocytes are exerting some sort of effect on the different cell composition. But I can't say that with any significant degree of certainty right now with the system I've got. I'm going to ask the opposite question. So when you ectopically express FOXI1 in a basal cell outside of the niche, do you get ionocyte-like maturation? Or is it really niche dependent? The morphology of the cell, to me, if that screams that the niche needs to be. So, that's a, it's interesting. So I've taken that, the, the docs inducible culture, like as a pure culture, not as a small admixture. If you turn on FOXI1 in every cell, that epithelium dies off within five to six days. And it's hard to characterize really if you're getting any significant differences in lineages. You really have to reduce it to at least a 50 50 mixture before you get something that approaches like, 12, 13 days and you start seeing some silly, but it's still a really dodgy epithelium. And 10% or so, you can get those cultures lasting more than three or four weeks. Um, and at that point you will see it, but it's, it's a 10, it's, it's no long, like you're, it's no longer a pure population, it's a minority population. I think at a certain threshold of ionocytes, it, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to be a viable epithelium. Let's thank Stuart for his fantastic presentation. Okay, uh, next presentation is Dr. Sasano from Kansas. Uh, inhibition of array with the array one with the ELD six or seven is immunomoderatory and reduces chronic lung disease in CF ferret. Thank you everybody for coming today. Um, thank you guys for um, choosing this data to be presented. I apologize for the long title, but um, here we are. So these are my disclosures. As you can see in the left, uh, in healthy airways, the proper functioning of CFTR promotes hydration of the mucus layer to support uh, mucus clearance. Um, do I have a point? The mouse. Oh, yeah, the mouse here, okay. Um, here on the right, you see that in cystic fibrosis, CF dysfunction results in dehydrated mucus that accumulates and pro um, 
excuse me, and promotes microbial infections, leading to neutrophilic infiltration, protease release, and goblet cell metroplasia. Today, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, ORI-1, that it's a calcium channel that is expressed in the lung, and you see it uh, here depicted in yellow. And we strongly believe that calcium signaling and ORI-1 are underappreciated drivers of inflammation in the lung. When calcium is depleted from the ER, this causes uh, STEM1 to relocate to the plasma membrane, where it forms a complex with ORI1 that it's essential for uh, its activation. So this activation promotes calcium influx that results in uh, NFAT translocating to the nucleus. And from there, it promotes pro-inflammatory changes in gene expression, as well as secretion of cytokines, mucins, and proteases. As I have mentioned before, this binding of um, ORI1 and STEM1, as you can see here, binding of this is essential for ORI1 activation, as I said before, and we actually take advantage of this and we use this colocalization as a marker for ORI1 activation. As per the methods that you see above, we measured this colocalization and we found that both in epithelia and immune cells in a CF tissue, as you can see in red, um, ORI1 and STEM1 are co-localized at a higher percentage than in normal tissue. Um, however, in alveoli, we do not see any hyperactivation, uh, which makes it also consistent to CF uh, being an airway disease. So it is important to note that in people that take trichafta, ORI1 remains active. ELD 607, or 607 for short, is a novel and selective ORI1 modulator that blocks the influx of um, calcium and leads to ORI1 internalization as well as lysosomal degradation. This brings a decrease in acute chronic inflammation and also reversal of lung remodeling and tissue damage. 607 is an uh, 11 amino acid long peptide that is highly selective for ORI1 as opposed to ORI2 or 3. It uh, shows no cellular toxicity in in vitro assays and it doesn't show any off target binding in a um, pharmacology screen. Also, and uh, this is important, it does not show any effects on human ERG, which is a subunit of a K channel that's involved in electrical activity in the heart, and it's very important for drug development. And then when inhaled, more than 95% of this peptide remains in the lung. Because ELD-607 inhibits calcium influx upstream from the inflammation pathway, as I mentioned before, we wanted to evaluate how the different disease-causing mutations shown here in the left affect this inhibition of calcium via ORI. In our non-transfected controls, as you can see here, calcium influx was inhibited by 607 um, as expected. Uh, then we transfected cells with wild type as well as the different uh, CFT CFTR mutations, as you can see here, where uh, 607 still retains the um, or I, um, excuse me, the calcium influx um, inhibition. Our data suggests that influx um, inhibition is mutation agnostic um, after administration of 607. Uh, so this is a key point uh, of this whole talk. Um, it also retains activity in CF patient sputum after incubation of um, um, for eight hours at 37 degrees. And when we retested with our in uh, in vitro inhibition of calcium, we see in green that it retains its inhibition as opposed to the parent compound in blue, where all the um, activity is gone. So ferrets, these are not in vivo, so we're going to um, higher level animals. Uh, ferrets um, that show a G551D um, mutation of the CFTR uh, channel is an established model for uh, CF lung disease. Uh, these ferrets are reared on a CFTR potentiator and then they're weaned off and they develop CF lung disease over several months. Our, our protocol um, 
shows, um, excuse me, our protocol uses uh, three different doses of 607 once a day for uh, one milligram per kilogram instilled intratracheally, and after 24 hours, we harvest blood, bowel, and whole lung. In this graph that I'm not going to talk too much about it, but um, uh, we did run a comprehensive metabolic panel. And uh, in black, you see the CF ferrets at baseline. And in green, you see them after administration of 607. The red dotted line above shows the expected normal values. And as you can see, there are no effects of 607 on the overall health of these ferrets. From the blood that we collected, we measure neutrophil levels to evaluate neutrophilia. After administration of 607 to these animals, neutrophilia was reduced to normal levels when compared to CF naive. Uh, as you can see, this is, um, this is shown in percentage, but in absolute neutrophil numbers, this effect remains the same. Uh, decreased macrophages return to wild type levels also after 607 administration, but these changes are mainly driven by the changes in neutrophilia. With the bowel, we run a proteomics uh, assay to assess whether the levels of proteins uh, are significantly reduced. On the left, you see a volcano plot, and on the highlighted blue section, you see that several proteins are significantly, significantly reduced after uh, 607. On the right, you can see how two key um, well-known drivers of lung disease in CF that we all know, neutrophil elastase and MAC5AC, they are reduced um, in this model. Uh, more specifically, neutrophil elastase uh, drives lung tissue damage in CF, and it cannot be detective, detected in this um, proteomics um, assay. MAC5AC that drives uh, mucus plugging and FEV1 uh, reduction in CF is also reduced after administration of 607. With the lungs that we harvested, we uh, stained them first with um, AB pass. On the left, you see a wild type ferret uh, that shows mucus free airways. Uh, in the center, you see CF naive animals that uh, show increased number of goblet cells that you can see here in blue. And then you also see mucus plug in. After we administered uh, 607 for three days, these airways uh, go back to un showing normal mucus and also reverse goblet cell metroplasia. In addition to this, we uh, stained the, um, the lungs with H&E. Uh, on the left, you see a wild type um, airway. And in the center, you see a CF naive um, ferret that presents uh, damage to the tissue, increased inflammation, and overall reduction in the airspace area. Uh, we show this qualitatively, and we show this image on purpose because it's uh, to represent one of the most affected areas in the lung. But we also show it uh, on the bottom left uh, qual quantitatively. Uh, we have we asked the pathologist to process uh, these slides and um, and score it using the Ashcroft score that um, is widely used to establish fibrosis in the lung. And as you can see, um, very interestingly, ELD 607 um, reverses fibrosis uh, in these animals. Uh, so this is very important because here we are showing not that it uh, slows down the progression of fibrosis, but we are actually reversing it. Our non-clinical data that it's shown here today, and then it's also uh, shown in other models that we have, uh, um, present similar endpoints um, for uh, those that are shown in CF patients that are taking trikafta. Among these, we saw decreased neutrophilia and inflammation, lung bacterial counts, mucus, um, decreased mucus, uh, decreased inflammatory cytokines, and um, airway wall thickening. And because we have these promising results, we are planning to move 607 into the clinic. So we all know here that uh, cystic fibrosis uh, is presented with chronic airway infection, neutrophilic inflammation, excess mucus production, and lung damage. And these, all, all these four factors um, <coughs> uh, create a vicious, a vicious cycle. So what we expect to see with 607 is that this vicious section 
excuse me, that this vicious cycle we will actually be stopped by um, abrogating neutrophilic inflammation, excess mucus production, but most importantly, as I have been mentioning throughout the slides, reversion of uh, lung damage that is currently uh, existing in CF uh, patients. And with this, I would like to acknowledge um, everybody who's behind uh, this work, uh, Syra Ahmed and, and the Elder Pharmaceuticals team, Robert Tarrant here in the audience, my boss at uh, 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 KUMC, John Engelhardt and Doug Bartels at the University of Iowa who uh, gave, um, let us play with uh, their ferrets, uh, UNC and Michael Tooney from Queens University at Belfast who's actually running a microbiome um, tests for us. And of course, um, our funders, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation who um, gave us resources to this, and actually two days ago, I received a notice that I have been awarded a pilot award uh, to continue this work, and also the NHLBI for, uh, for giving us more support. And with that, I'll take questions. I found your data on uh, proteomics quite interesting uh, when you showed the volcano plot. Uh, most of your proteins, they were towards the negative side, which means they were down-regulated. Have you tried to compare this with the transcriptomics data to confirm that if it is not altogether altering the transcriptome? Because when you have shown that um, log plot, most of your data, even the ones that are not down-regulated, most of the proteins are on the negative side. So what is the reason for that? So this is an ongoing study. Um, so we are comparing the data. Uh, I don't know, so Rob here in the audience. Almost all the immune cells express RE1, crack m one Skid kids that are immune deficient have a mutation in RE1, crack m one So if you are thinking to systematically treat the kids or the patient, any concern with drastic immunodeficiencies, the patients? We actually do not see that effect. Um, so that's good, but Rob has something to say. I do. So in answer to your question, so Splunk1, our other favorite protein is a CF gene modifier. CF patients that have more Splunk1 are healthier. So 607 is, Splunk1 binds and inhibits all right naturally. 607 is derived from Splunk C terminus. It basically works the same way as Splunk 1. Um, Splunk is down, tends to be down in CF patients, so we're kind of adding back a protein that should normally be there. And we've loaded mice with 10 to the 7 pseudomonas or staph, and actually we don't see immunosuppression. We see clear, clearing out of the bacteria. So. Flori, I was wondering, you compared 607 with Trikovka, and I can't help but think, wouldn't it be also wonderful to combine your compound with a CFTR restoring treatment? Yes. First of all, I want to clarify, we're not comparing in the sense of that we're saying 607 is great as Trikafta, but we are comparing the endpoints that we see in patients compare what we see in vivo. Uh, and because this is an ongoing process, we are starting just with 607 and down the line probably with the ferret model or any um, or other uh, higher animals like NHPs or, or, um, or similar, we will do combination either to probably to see if they're synergistic or if there's any, um, any improvements or benefits. Wonderful, thank you, Flori. Thank you. Now it's my big pleasure to introduce our last speaker, Nam Soo Yu from Stanford University, and he will educate us on some mechanistic insights into synergistic mucosally clearance by combined adrenergic and cholinergic agonists. Hello, my name is Nam Soo, and I have a still 40 minutes to wrap up this uh, <laughs> workshop. So time is so, running. Yeah, but I'm going to speak very slowly. Um, okay. 20 minutes. Oops. Uh, this, is, uh, this is disclosure. Uh, 
the method I'm going to present today is, uh, has been uh, submitted to patent uh, acquisition. Uh, I would like to acknowledge first, especially thankful to uh, Jeff White and Carlos Mia and many, many uh, collaborators who advanced these studies. Background, uh, mucociliary clearance is indispensable airway innate defense mechanism and it is impaired in muco-obstructive disorders, including CF subject and contribute to lung disease. CFTL moderators improve mucus clearance in most CF patients. However, people who are not tolerable or refractory to CFTL moderators or whose mutations are not targeted by them remain at high risk. Therefore, improving mucociliary clearance could help such a patient. So to run ex vivo uh, animal experiment to assess mucociliary clearance, uh, we developed simple but arrogant method uh, spearheaded by my colleague, Jin Hyo. Uh, whole trachea from newborn piglet or ferret are dissected from the body and open up through a dorsal central line and mounted on, as you can see here, uh, in pliable seal guard platform using insect pins. In a way, apical side uh, contact to 95% O2 and 5% CO2, highly humidifying environment, and basolateral side contact to uh, best solution. Uh, when you drop a Xerox particle to the, uh, to the uh, distal area of the tracheal preparation, as you shown here, the movement of particles uh, unidirectional way from distal to proximal being recorded and using time-lapse uh, digital camera. While we are running uh, x vivo of a wild type fetal trachea using cyclic AMP agonists such as forscorin and low dose of our calcium agonists such as carbac or cholinergic uh, agent, uh, this graph show uh, time course of mucociliary clearance velocity. And as you can see, forscorin or low dose of carbac itself induce some mucociliary clearance velocity. But when you combine those two, it produces much larger uh, MCCV than additive, it's, so it's a, a synergistic. More importantly, uh, we found that a synergistic mucociliary clearance uh, is reproducible in CF uh, ferro trachea as well. As you expected, uh, this is again time course of MCCV and Cyclic AMP agonist force scoring did almost nothing in MCCB, but when added low dose of carbacol, it induced some. And when you combine those two drugs, you can see a synergistic mucociliary clearance velocity in CF ferret, as shown in summary data. The main hypothesis to test in this study was low dose cholinergic plus uh, beta-adrenergic agonists accelerate mucociliary clearance velocity more than their predictive, predicted additive effects, so it's a uh, synergistic. However, the concepts seem counterintuitive because response to beta-adrenergic cyclic AMP agonist is missing or defective in patients with CF, and cholinergic drug is known to induce airway constriction, so there is a safety issue. For these reasons, the therapeutic possibility of the combined agonist might have escaped notice. So we test uh, FDA-approved uh, inhalable drug beta-adrenergic uh, FMT and uh, methacholine, low dose of methacholine in CF trachea. Again, Beta-adrenergic drug, uh, cyclic AMP agonist, did almost nothing in uh, CF ferret, but when you combine with low dose of methacholine, it produced synergistic mucociliary clearance in CF ferret. 
And it is not species specific because uh, we have done with the uh, newborn piglet trachea, two to three days old uh, piglet trachea harvested at UC Davis and the fresh tissue was mounted the same way I described earlier. And when you uh, treat with uh, either formoterol here or uh, methacholine, they do induce some mucociliary clearance velocity. When you combine those two, it again produce synergistic mucociliary clearance velocity. As shown in the summary data, synergy agonist induced uh, MCCB is significantly larger than the arithmetic sum of uh, MCCB induced by beta adrenergic drug formoterol plus low dose of methacholine. As I mentioned, the cholinergic drug itself causes airway construction, constriction, so there is a safety issue. So whether beta adrenergic drug can prevent cholinergic drug induced airway constriction, we develop a simple method uh, by slicing around 1.5 millimeter, millimeter thickness of uh, either trachea or newborn piglet trachea and treated with a cholinergic drug alone, low dose of cholinergic drug alone or in the presence of beta adrenergic, whether it can prevent cholinergic drug induced airway narrowing as shown here by measuring uh, inner surface area. As shown in this uh, graph in the CF ferret, cholinergic drug carbacol alone cause uh, around 20% of airway narrowing but in the presence of cyclic AMP agonist, it prevents cholinergic drug-induced uh, airway narrowing. So next question is uh, whether it works in, in vivo because all the drug I have been shown has been done in a bath, so bath retral assessment of drug. But uh, to be uh, in vivo condition, it's supposed to be added in apical side in inhalable way. So we use uh, in vivo shim model of CF. As you can see, this is again time cost of uh, tracheal mucociliary clearance velocity. And when conscious ship inhaled uh, CFTR172, it reduced uh, MCCB, as you can see. And then to mimic human inframed CF airway, uh, human neutropil elastase was added in at two hour here, and it further decreased MCCV, and it maintains suppressed condition at least 24 hours, as you as shown here. And at time four, uh, when you add beta adrenergic drug for motoral, it slightly increased MCCV, but when you combine for motoral with a very low dose of uh, methacholine, in this case, one microgram of methacholine is significantly increased MCCV. And when you add increased uh, methacholine, 12 microgram, it further increased uh, MCCV. As shown in this uh, summary data, uh, synergy agonists significantly increase mucociliary clearance uh, velocity when compared to or non-drug treated one in model of CF. The next question is, is it safe to uh, human use? So uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Carlos Mia and his clinical trial team at Stanford Clinic, they carry out a phase one safety uh, study. As you can see here, healthy control as well as CF subject, they measure delta FEV1 and minus 20 indicated severe adverse effect and minus 10 is 10% 10 is intolerance. As shown, ascending dose of methacholine in the presence of uh, formoterol, you can see uh, none of uh, synergy agonists both in uh, healthy control or CF subject trigger any uh, safety issue. So it appears very safe. So to address whether synergy agonist has additional benefit on uh, trikefta ETI on CF cells, we test uh, Delta F508 uh, primary human control and CF nasal epithelial cells. 
and measure so-called effective diffusivity, multi-particle movements on the cell culture. Uh, as you can see, no drug, no agonist was added. This is uh, Delta 508 homozygous cell culture, and it pr provides this red line. And when you treat it with the tricapta, it increases uh, effective diffusivity. And synergy agonist also further decrease, uh, increase uh, multi-particle movement cross to control without agonist addition. And when you combine uh, ETI and synergy agonist, it improve furthermore the effective diffusivity, indicating uh, synergy agonist, synergy agonist provide uh, additional benefit to own uh, ETI in CF cultures. How about the mechanism of uh, synergistic mucocellular clearance? Uh, the graph show time course of uh, granular secretion rate, uh, single gran granular secretion rate. As you can see, low dose of carbacol itself induce a little bit of uh, granular secretion rate. And when you combine a synergy agonist, in this case, 0.3 micromolar of carbacol plus 10 micromolar of phosphorine, produce a synergistic a granular secretion. As shown in this short clip of movie, uh, this is a pig mucosa detached from underlying cartilage and mounted on pliable silicon platform using, again, uh, these insect pins. The surface was cleaned and then dry up and added uh, water-saturated mineral, heavy mineral oil. As you can see, there are multiple uh, spontaneously generated uh, mucus bubble from a single submucosal gland. And this is uh, uh, 20 minutes of basal and 30 minutes of uh, low dose of carbacol, followed by a synergy agonist and 10 minutes interval take a look. This is basal and the carbacol alone. And when you add a fourth chlorine on top of carbacol, it produces synergistically increased submucosal gland secretion. Uh, to assess whether a synergy agonist contain a component that suppress uh, surface inact activity, uh, we measure mucosylid clearance velocity in the presence of or absence of inact uh, epithelial sodium channel inhibitor, uh, benzamyl. As you can see, in the presence of a uh, benzamyl treatment, uh, mucocellular clearance velocity was significantly six times uh, more increased compared to DMSO-treated uh, piglet trachea. However, when you add uh, synergy agonist, regardless of benzamyl treatment, it produced comparable mucocellular clearance velocity, indicating synergy agonist may have a component that suppress uh, inact activity. We also measure bicarbonate output using a pH set uh, method. As you can see here with the uh, peak trachea mucosa, uh, comparing to baseline synergy agonist increase, significantly increase bicarbonate output. And in collaboration with uh, my colleague, uh, Juan Yanovsky group in Canada, uh, we use powerful X-ray synchrotron to measure airway surface liquid height. As you can see here, a beta adrenergic drug itself increased uh, ASL height and the synergy agonist further increased ASL height comparing to baseline. And uh, as shown here in uh, summary data, synergy agonist is significantly uh, larger rate of delta ASL height in, comparing to uh, formoteral alone or basal. Summary, a synergy agonist increase surface secretion and synergistically increase uh, submucosal gland secretion. And in, in turn, they suppress surface fluid absorption and resulting in uh, increased ASL volume, as you just seen, and increased ciliary bit frequency. And this coordinated action of uh, fluid absorption and suppression uh, cause uh, synergistic mucociliary 
uh, clearance velocity without uh, airway narrowing. And there is a postal 200 if you are interested in, come, uh, please drop by. Thank you. Thank you, Namsu. <laughs> Any questions for Namsu? And I would like everybody to stay because we have also some online questions. And while you think about asking Namsu oh. some intriguing question, I will ask Kevin Chen to the microphone right here. And uh, you have a question from Mara Lakovic Scroggins, which is after single cell sequencing in the first generation GFP mouse, you show differences in cell population proportions. If you expect this to go to first in humans, eventually would that difference in cell populations after injury or regeneration have any long-term clinical impact? Long question. Yeah, that's, that is a great question. Um, uh, the, the reconstituted uh, epithelium, the proportion of the cells are different when we tra transplant, but uh, the impact of these relative proportions on what it may look like in a human um, I think it's something that we do have to explore, and I don't know what the impact of having uh, more certain pop cell populations would result, but as we're seeing it in these uh, diseases like cystic fibrosis, where we may have a uh, increased amount of secretory cells, um, there could be, we should, we should monitor what happens when we have different populations. Great, thank you. Yeah. Then we take a question from Namsu, I assume. Yeah, so um, maybe I should be asking Carlos since I see him over there. But in the clinical study, did you exclude people with asthma or people with CF and asthma? No. no. <laughs> Answer is no. How, how many? How many of those subjects had asthma? Well, not not so much. I'm working. I'm more thinking about the provocation of people with asthma with methacholine, and are you just flat out preventing that with the permoderol? No, we don't know. We don't know exactly how it's but just presence in the literature that it will be suppressed in the wrong area. And we have people that were reacting. Do you want to step Metacolin. up to the microphone? We didn't do metacoline challenge, yeah. but based on history, we know they have reactivity because of ABPA, allergies, their own inhaled steroids. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you didn't see any construction? You didn't no. See any? No one. Actually, we saw increases in uh, FEV1 in most. Thank you. As a pediatric pulmonologist, I got a critical so, question. No, not a specific. <laughs> well, you can ask. Ish. I, I guess my 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 thought is, um, you know, in term, how long what was the longest time point you studied out in terms of the increase in, in mucociliary clearance? Because when I think about, it's like ep, clinical application would be is is this something where you're seeing an effect that lasts? Hours? Oh, well, as you can see, uh, like I, I in this, your longest. yeah, this is in vivo data, right? Uh, right? This is single inhalation at time four, and it sustained like 20 hours, at least, yeah. So, uh, so maybe that's quite, uh, yeah, sustainable with a single inhalation of this drug. So, so it fit into the typical, well, previously typical NEB regime that our patients were bothered. And I, my other question was, in terms of the concentrations of methacholine you're using, I, I forget if you'd shown it, how does Stuart, that- can you get a little closer? Oh, sorry. In terms of the concentration of the methacholine mm -hmm. you're using, how does that compare to what we typically use in like a bron bronchoprovocation challenge? Like, is it like a, a much lower dose or a comparable dose or? It's about two lower than the Twofold lowest lower. dose that can induce bronchoconstriction. Right. So we started really low. And so there is still a chance we can increase uh, methacholine dose. It may provide us pro probably uh, optimal uh, dose with the uh, uh, formoterol. We don't know yet, but uh, we didn't challenge uh, more than 12 microgram. No, I, I think it's really interesting working, especially, you know, um, obviously, we're at NACFC, but we have a lot of patients who have sort of mucus clearance issues. We have mm -hmm. patients with PCD, non-CF related bronchiectasis who yeah. are on similar to CF airway clearance regimens and anything that could be used to help those patients may may also mm -hmm. be, be of therapeutic interest. So I think it's, it's really cool work. All right. Thank you. If anybody has any comments, now's your chance, Matt. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have a physics question that I'll ask you at the poster, but um, I guess I was wondering, have you studied this in a small airways model uh, without glands or um, I guess you've done it in cell cultures, but have you looked in more distal regions of airways, what it's doing in the auxiliary clearance, what it's doing to... Uh, the answer like is that. no, we didn't particularly look at the uh, distal airway, but uh, when we run uh, this in vivo study, uh, the whole uh, clearance study, then uh, they still, this drug uh, facilitate uh, whole lung clearance in in vivo, the whole lung, not just the trachea, but whole lung clearance yeah, the same way as uh, trachea measurement. And this was done via uh, like scintigraphy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, cool. You have, do you have uh, data on like C over P or anything like that? Like central versus peripheral deposition. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with you. Sure. Yeah, you can ask me later. Yeah, for yeah, sure. the, the right. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Next question. Hi, interesting stuff. Uh, Ian Thornell, University of Iowa. I'm, I'm wondering whether your synergy is, is coming from uh, two receptors on a single cell versus targeting of, of different cell types and processes. For example, increasing cilia beat frequency and secretion through two separate cells, or is it just one cell? That well, that's a very uh, good question. It can be both. Uh, I mean, uh, one is uh, muscarine receptor, right? Uh, because we add uh, methacholine and carbacol, so you should either uh, muscarine or nicotinic, but I don't think nicotinic uh, receptor environment is probably minimum in this uh, condition. And the other one is uh, beta adrenergic. So uh, I guess it's a both beta receptor and muscarine receptor, but it can be yeah, possibly single cell that yeah. contain both uh, receptors or it can be. Yeah, you can easily see yeah, it yeah, in yeah, either yeah. way. Yeah. 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 Right. All right, let's thank Nam Su. And we have a few more online questions and now is your chance to ask about any of the other presentations if you had a question later on. This one is for Flori or uh, Flori Sassano or Rob Terran. And the question is, is it better to target Aura 1 or STEM? Or why did you target Aura 1 and not STEM? So, um... As a trained pharmacologist, ORI1 is uh, expressed on the membrane, so it's always better and easier. That's just a pharmacologist in me. Thank you. And I would like to thank all the speakers for their fantastic presentations and uh, for the questions that we received and for the wonderful discussions. Thank you. Thank you.